Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid?
Let me rest in your love. You said that love from above. Let me rest in your grace. Oh, such amazing grace. in your power that power is good every hour oh Lord let me rest let me rest in you let me rest and I'll see this journey through yes Lord let me rest. in Jesus. He came down from above. Let me rest in your grace. Your grace greater than my sin. Let me rest in your power. A mighty fortress is our God. Every day, every second, every every hour Father let me rest oh Lord the day is long but hallelujah thou art strong oh Lord let me rest Scripture readings taken from Matthew 13, verses 24 to 43. Matthew 13, verses 24, says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sows good seeds in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field from whence when has it tears? 28. He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while we gather up the tares, he root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them 
and bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat unto my barn. 31. Another parable put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and become a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branch thereof. Another sparrow spoke he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. 36. Then Jesus said the multitudes away and went on to the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parables of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of God. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tears are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angel. And therefore, the tears are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angel, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them in the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of his father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. May the Lord add a special blessing unto his word. Thank you. Uh, the message this morning uh, is contending for the faith, and we're going to be on a slightly different uh, plane. Um, but you know, it's so important that it is a pity that sometimes as we contend for the faith, that we fight against each other. And if you're here this morning and you realize you're one of those who is trying to hurt others, you're helping the enemy. Sometimes we don't realize that. That as we hurt each other with words from our mouths and our attitudes, we are working for the enemy. And so this morning, the message God has laid on my heart is entitled, Contending for the Faith. And would to God that every one of us may stop helping the enemy, but in instead we will get involved in the program of God. Because this is not a playground. This is a battleground. President Roosevelt hated the long reception lines at the White House because he found out that no one really paid attention to what was being said. So one day, President Roosevelt decided he was going to try something different. So uh, as each person passed down the receiving line and shook his hand, uh, President Roosevelt said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> the people responded, so one, one person said, marvelous, keep up the good work. Another person said, we are proud of you. God bless you, sir. It was not until the end of the line while receiving the ambassador from Bolivia that the words were actually heard. And the ambassador from Bolivia, without hesitating, said to him, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> 
Well, I believe God has something special to say to us today, and I trust we'll be listening to his voice. And, and, and this morning, as we get to chapter 13 of the Gospel of Matthew, God, as the Lord Jesus tries to get his message across to us, for the first time, Jesus speaks to us in miracles. Now, what is a miracle? Just as I pass by. You remember when we were in Sunday school, we were taught that a, 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 a parable, what's a parable? Did I say what's a miracle? What's a parable? What's a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's a simple definition. And uh, when I was looking it up, in, I found that Eastman's Bible Dictionary, that's exactly what it says. A heavenly story with an earthly meaning. In other words, what's that? Did I say miracle again? Did I say it the wrong way? Thanks, Richard. It's good to have your brother right up here in front to keep you straight. And he's my older brother too. A, bro a parable is a heavenly story. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Amen. Did I get it right? And I might as just well tell you right now, we've been having such a good time in church today that you see what time they put me on. So you know I'm not going to land this plane at 12.30. Amen. In fact, in fact, as I was getting up, now that I've said that, I guess I'll relax a little now that I've got that off my chest. But uh, as I was getting up, a couple of the brothers said to me, Brother Brian, the meeting doesn't start till 1 o'clock anyhow, so they're going to have to be here till 1, so just relax. So just relax. Visitors, this is, we don't normally go quite as long, so you come back. Don't get turned off because we may go a little bit beyond 12.30 this morning. Amen? Amen. But a parable is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In other words, there's deep spiritual truth behind every single parable and they do require some digging. They do require some spiritual insight. And this morning, we're going to begin looking at, there are seven parables in this one, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. And this morning, uh, I intend to dis discuss four of them with you today and next week. I'm going to flip it backwards, and I'm going to do three today, and I'm going to hold the first one until next Sunday, because the one for next Sunday is particularly helpful for our friend and family day. I hope you're inviting your friends. I believe God has given us a very special message and by his, the way he has worked it out, we are right here in Matthew's Gospel chapter 13 because Matthew's Gospel chapter 13 as we share the parable of the sower, you're going to find that every single person in church next week is going to be addressed by the word of God. There is not one person that's going to be here that the word of God is not going to speak to. So you make sure that you're here and you make sure you bring your friends. Remember we do have cards, invitation cards in the lobby that you can use to invite your friends and your relatives to come and encourage them to come and join us for dinner. So be working now because God I believe has a special message as he shares. Next week I'll be sharing a message entitled how to make sure you're on the road to heaven. How to make sure you're on the road to heaven. And if you have a friend who needs to be sure, you bring them next week. Satan is doing everything to oppose the growth of the kingdom of God. And next week we're going to see what he does to discourage people from getting saved in the first place. But today's message, as we look at it, we're going to find out that even after individuals get saved, Satan does not give up. And Satan does every single thing he can to discourage the growth of the kingdom. He does everything he possibly can to discourage you in your walk with God. And today, I want to look at three of the strategies. I believe these are three of Satan's principal strategies. 
I'm going to call them macro strategies versus micro strategies because these strategies that we're going to see today are directed at the church as a whole. They're directed at Christendom as a whole. They're not necessarily targeting you as an individual, but they're directed to Christendom as a whole. The problem is that sometimes, because it's not directed at you, you may get complacent and may, and may start feeling there is no battle after all. You know that uh, when World War II, uh, uh, when Hitler started uh, doing his thing, the British and the French to, uh, 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 really uh, had a blind eye to what Hitler was doing. And they allowed him to do all sorts of stuff in Europe and to take over Austria and to take over Czechoslovakia. Slovakia and the Britain, uh, British, Britain stayed out of it because it, it, it didn't really involve them and they tried their best uh, to, to appease him and he just kept going and going. And my opinion is, my opinion is, had it not been for countries like the United States getting in that battle, Britain may have fallen to the Nazis after all. I'm no war student. But listen, sometimes if we, if, if, if we pretend there is no battle, when a battle is raging, my friend, I want you to remember the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. This is no time to be at ease. In fact, in Jude chapter 3, just look, Jude verse 3, Jude verse 3, just jump there please, and you know that's towards the back of your Bible. It's Jude and then Revelation, so it's, it's a one chapter book. It's only one chapter, Jude and verse number 3, and the word of God says there in Jude number 3, he says, Jude writes, he says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. He said, I really wanted to write about the common salvation, but the Spirit of God pressed on me and urged me that I write to you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to to the saints and he goes on and he says for certain men whose condemnation was written about have slipped in among us and we're going to stop right there but suffice it to say what the word of God God wants you and me to contend for the faith God wants you and me to what Amen. to contend for the faith Let's share quickly three ways Satan opposes God's kingdom. Number one, Satan opposes God's kingdom by planting. Satan plants false Christians. Three parables. The first, Satan plants false Christians. And it was just read to us in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30, where the Lord Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And, and Jesus goes on and interprets it for us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 37 to 30, 43. And he lets us know the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, the true believer. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are part of that good seed. But then he says, while everybody was sleeping, somebody came and planted some weeds. If you have the King James, it says tears. And some of you are wondering, uh, as our brother would, uh, who was crying? <laughs> Nobody was crying. It's weeds. Okay, it's, a, it, it's the same word here. Weeds. Somebody came and planted some weeds. And Jesus tells us who planted the weeds. He said this, the evil one, Satan, has come and he's planted some weeds. And I'm here to tell you this morning, listen good, listen good, listen good. There are some fake Christians in the church. Oh my. Oh my. Did, did, you, did, you, did you know that? No, 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 hold on. I'm going to get to this eventually, so, so let me just tell you, don't try to be a detective, amen? Coca-Cola used to call themselves the real thing, you remember? Then after a while they came out with Coke Classic and New Coke, so that means these were not the real thing. <laughs> if the original was the real thing, these couldn't be the real... Are you the real thing? Are you the real thing? Are you really saved? Are you sure Jesus Christ lives in you? Has he changed you from the inside out? 
Was there really a time in your life when you came to Jesus Christ and said, Oh God, I recognize I'm a sinner and I want to change. And you turned, listen, you turned from sin. You see, it's impossible, it's impossible to be a part of the good seed if you came to Jesus and all you did was say, come into my heart, into my heart, Lord Jesus. Do you know that there are people here, and next week we're going to dig deeper into this, but there are, there are some people who sometimes believe they are Christians because they pray the sinner's prayer. They said, into my heart, into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today. Listen, you could pray that, you could sing that a hundred times if there's never repentance repentance in your life and heart if you never come to the point where you're saying I'm tired of sin and strength God I want your way I'm repenting I'm turning from my sin the problem is there are too many people in church who are holding on to their sin and trying to hold on to God at the same time you can't do it and so the question, listen good, the first question of the morning is, are you a real Christian or are you one of the weeds? No, I can't answer that question for you. It's not easy to make the distinction, you know. Verse 29 of our passage, Jesus says, leave them alone because while you're pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat. For a while, wheat and weeds look just like the same. You know what this tells me? It's possible that there's somebody here. It's possible that there's somebody here. You fit in so well with the church. You fit in so well with Christians. It's possible you may even start fooling yourself into believing you're the real thing. And so this morning, the Spirit of God would come to your door, and He's knocking on your door. And, and I believe there may be somebody here. He may be shaking up, and He's asking, He's making you ask yourself the question, are you sure you're for real? Are you sure you're the real thing? Oh, I met, I met people who, who, who thought or said they were Christians for years. Went on mission trips. Did you know that? I, I have known people who went on mission trips because it seemed like they were so committed to Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, it turns out that there was never a work of grace done in their heart and in their life. And so I need to ask you the question. God is asking you. He knows the answer. But the Spirit of God is knocking on your door. And he's trying to get you to make sure you are the real thing. Would to God you'd clear that up this morning. But how does planting false Christians in the church serve Satan's purposes? How does this help him out? How does, uh, let me suggest a couple of reasons. Number one, in my opinion, one of the reasons he does this is because fake Christians often cause distractions and divisions. You know, if you're not careful, if, if the leaders of the church aren't alert to the voice of God. Folks will get you into all sort of stuff you ought not to be doing. They, they, they can get you off message. Do you know that? People can get you sidetracked. Because remember now, this person who, who doesn't have the spirit, this person who is a fake Christian, they look good, they smell good, they sound good, but the spirit of God doesn't live in them. They don't have the, 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 the spiritual motivation that a true born again Christian has. And so sometimes they'll distract you and sometimes they'll cause confusion and divisions in the church. And listen, the spirit of God is all about unity. The Spirit of God is all about unity. But sometimes these folks will cause all sorts of... Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you that everybody who causes uh, division uh, is, is a fake Christian. I'm not saying that. But for sure, that's one of the things that Satan is about. But secondly, uh, one of the things that if Satan is about, he knows that the unsaved uh, are looking around to see how people in the church are living. Amen? And the first thing they're going to say is, the church is not but a bunch of hypocrites. You ever heard that one? Anybody ever heard that line? Well, you realize that one of the biggest disincentives for people to get saved, he has all these fake Christians right in the church, and folks can look on and say, 
It's, these Christians are no different than I am. But thirdly, one of the things that why I think that he has fake Christians is because he realizes that a fake Christian can lead you astray. In light of this, how do I contend? How do I contend? This is war. How do I contend? Number one, be a discerning follower. Be a discerning follow, follower. Be careful who you follow. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Listen, you write that down. Don't you ever forget that. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. If your friends are not modeling the example of Christ, do not follow them. They may have all the right spiritual sounding phrases. If they're not following the example of Christ, do not follow them. I, 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 I go a step further. If your leaders, if we as leaders are not following the example of Christ, do not follow us. Challenge us. I said to somebody the other day, it is never wrong as a Christian to challenge your leaders when they're not following Christ. Don't ever sit and allow us not to follow Christ. We are just human and sometimes we may slip up, we may miss the boat. You come and show us scripture and challenge us and don't follow us. Be a discerning follower. But secondly, be an evangelist, not a detective. <laughs> Do you hear me? You see, you see, here's what I find out. Christians love to be detectives. Nobody really wants to get out there and share the word of God. But we always want to wonder what's wrong with somebody else. We always think somebody is deficient. Somebody short. Probably they're not for real. They, they need attention. You know. But you see, God is not... It's interesting. It's interesting that the Spirit of God lets us know that your detective work may not be satisfactory because God says, leave them alone. <laughs> they're going to be right here. So give up on the detective work. Listen, God is going to take care of his own business. Somebody say amen. amen. Did, 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 did you read what I read there in Math, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 40? Here's what it says. As the weeds are pulled up, verse 40, and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God is going to take care of his own business. He doesn't need you as his detective to try and figure out who is the right one. Spread the word! That's my responsibility and yours. How, 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 how actively are you involved in getting this message out? But then thirdly, stay awake. I'm not talking about right now. <laughs> stay awake. There's a very important phrase in verse 25. Did everybody get it? What did it say? While everyone was sleeping. The evil one did his planting while the sons of the kingdom were sleeping. A sleeping church gives Satan every opportunity to plant false Christians. So are you, are you asleep? You, you know, one of the ways to fall asleep, you know, what, you know what worries me? I am really disturbed that we are so involved in our own stuff that so many of us have put the things of God in the back seat. 
I'm so into my stuff. God's business is in the back seat. One of the ways to fall asleep is to be too much into myself. I want us to look at a scripture in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, trying to make some decisions while, while I speak here. Romans chapter 13. Uh, verse number 11, and do this, understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside, in other words, he's saying the, the, the opportunity for you to serve God is almost done. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And part of what puts us to sleep is that we are making provision for the flesh. It says here, don't make provision for the flesh. Don't, 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 don't make so much time to make, give the flesh what it wants. Sometimes some of us, what we do to give the flesh what it wants is that we want a whole lot of time to watch TV. We want a whole lot of time to go to the movies. We want a lot of time to do our stuff. We, uh, some people have had trouble with certain, with certain ha bad habits. And so they, they make provision. They have a smoking habit that they're trying to break. But they buy a six, a, 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 what do they call it? A, a whatever number comes in the pack. <laughs> That's the cigarettes I'm talking about. You want to give up drinking because you have a serious alcoholic problem, but you make sure you always have a six pack at home. Hey, listen, listen. He says, don't make any provision for the flesh in whatever your area is. Don't make any provision for the flesh. An Indian chief was talking to a group of braves and he was telling them, you know, the struggle within is like, is like two dogs fighting inside. He said, sometimes uh, one, the, the good dog uh, who wants you to do the right thing, the good dog who wants you to do the right thing, sometimes he's winning. And sometimes the, the bad dog who wants to do the wrong thing, he seems to be winning. Uh, and so he says, uh, but sometimes a bad dog is strong and, and the wrong is, is winning. So, so, so here, 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 here's the question. One of the braves says to him, so, so, so tell me, who's going to win in the end? The one you feed is his answer. You know, how many of you, you don't need to raise your hand. Am I speaking to anybody who as a Christian has a struggle going on on the inside? That, that, there, that there is some, and if you say no, you're a liar, okay? How I know that? Because the Apostle Paul, who I think was a little more spiritual than me and you, he told you he had the struggle. So every one of us has a struggle going on on the inside. It happens from time to time. We're, 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 there's some, some part of you want to do the bad thing and another part wants to do the good thing. And there's this tussle. And, and, and here's the bottom line. The one who wins in the end is the one you feed. The dog who wins is the dog you feed. And some of us, come on now. Oh, I wish I had time to preach this morning. Some of us now, we starve the Spirit of God. Bible study, prayer meeting, church, I don't have time for that. Fellowship with believers, I don't have time for that. We starve the Spirit of God. But oh, did you say, did you, did, were you talking about a show? Were, were you talk, what, what did you say? Listen, listen. It is not going to work. This, we are in a battle, not a playground. 
And my Christian friend, you are not going to be a victorious Christian if you starve. Listen, there are some of you who are young Christians and perhaps you've never felt the Spirit of God challenge you this, uh, like this. But I'm hoping right now you're sensing that God is saying, you can do better. You can do better. You don't have to live your Christian life all the while hanging on by a thread. But the ball is in your court. You have got to make some decisions. You have got to make some sacrifices. You have got to decide to feed the dog you want to win. Amen. Amen. Well, I better move on. Number two. Satan fosters false church growth. The mustard seed was the smallest of the garden seeds at that time. We're talking now about the parable of the mustard seed. And you see that right there in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, and um, uh, verse number uh, uh, 31. He tells him the parable of the mustard seed. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. And as Jesus tells them this story about this little seed that was going to become this great tree, the people there realized that Jesus was talking about something that was strange. You say, why was it strange? Yes, a mustard seed is the smallest of the garden seeds, but listen, a mustard seed does not become a big tree with big branches. So immediately, the hearers would know that Jesus was trying to make a point. Jesus was actually saying the growth of the kingdom of heaven would be unusual and phenomenal. A mustard seed becomes a big plant, but it does not become a big tree with large branches. Jesus is saying that this little mustard seed, this little seed, this church of Jesus Christ that would start out as a tiny thing in Jerusalem was going to have phenomenal growth. My friend, history has told us that. Here we are in uh, United States of America preaching about this Jesus. This, this church has spread to here. It spread to, to Jamaica. It spread to Costa Rica. It spread all over this world. This little thing, it has had phenomenal growth despite every attempt to stop the advance of the church. One of the Roman emperors at one time declared that he has succeeded in getting rid of every Bible from the face of the earth. And yet today the Bible is the most printed book in the world. Nobody, no way, no how can stop the growth of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so in your generation and in mine, despite incredible persecution, Muslims in Iran and other countries that are supposedly close to missionary are coming to Jesus Christ by the thousands. Did you know that? In this generation, Muslims are coming to Jesus Christ by the thousands in Asia and in parts of Africa. The church of Jesus Christ is exploding. He had said, not even the gates of hell can prevail against it. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But Jesus had a very interesting statement in verse 32. Because in verse 32, did you notice what he says in verse 32? He says, as it grew, the birds came. Now, we didn't read this. Next week we're going to deal with this. But if you look in verse 4 of Matthew 13, Jesus tells you who the birds are. First chap chapter 13, verse 4. As he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path. And who came? The birds. And now if you jump with me to, to, to verse number 19, he defines for you who the bird is. 
In verse 19, he said, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches the seed. The birds are the evil one, the devil. Jesus was letting them know that the kingdom of God would grow phenomenally, but at that, as it grew, the devil would take a seat in the branches to influence what was going on. Satan fosters false church growth. As we survey the Christian landscape, there is certainly a rapid expansion. The question is, is some of this real? Or is there some false growth? You know, here's what's sad. You can attend some churches all your life and never hear a clear presentation of the gospel. It's not a tragedy. You can go to church, you can join every organization in that church, and it is possible to never ever hear how you can be saved. You may hear a message about how to get riches, material riches, but never a message on how to receive eternal riches. You know, it's so got, it's gotten so bad, and I think I told you this story before, how I was listening to the television, and I heard this pastor, he's pastor of a church with over 40,000 members, and he gave a message in which he told the congregation he'd never preach a message about sin. He said, folks have such a hard week, the one thing they don't need is to come to church to hear a message about sin. My friend, if you come to this church, so there are some visitors, if you come here, you're going to hear a little bit about, not a little, you're going to hear a lot about sin. Oh, I'm praying that as God gives me strength, I will always preach about sin. You know why? The only reason Jesus came is because of they realize if, if there was no sin, there was no need, Jesus spending, leaving heaven to come here and dying. He died for your sin. My friend, listen, there are some people who are going to miss heaven because they refuse to accept the fact that they are sinners. But if you're here this morning and you're willing to recognize that you are a sinner, that you're fallen short of God's mark, and if you're willing to reach out to him, he is willing to forgive you and to save you. Hallelujah. Listen, it's good news. The we don't want, don't want to preach about sin, you know. If all we told you is about sin, sin by itself, that's bad. But the good news is, we've got a savior. Praise the Lord. We have got a savior. Hallelujah. So, 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 so if this is what Satan is up to, if this is what Satan is up to, how can I safeguard myself? How do I, how do I protect myself? Ephesians chapter 4. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And let's read here. Mark this in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses number 11 through 15, the Word of God says, It was He, the Lord Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. Stop here. I didn't intend to say this. Let me just squeeze this in. Listen, those, you know, sometimes you run into people who say, Oh, I can, I can read the Bible for myself at home. You ever heard anybody say that? Yes, you can and you ought to, but that ain't good enough. Why? Because God has given certain gifts to the church for your benefit and for mine. There are gifts given to the church. No, you cannot. Just doing it by yourself at home is not God's plan. That's part of the plan, but that's not all of the plan. Let's read on. He, he gave them these gifts to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Listen, verse number 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become, my Bible says, mature. What does yours say? Some says perfect until we come to spiritual perfection, spiritual maturity. It's not perfect in the sense that you don't sin anymore. But listen, it is possible that we can grow up and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be 
infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, etc., etc. Listen, God wants you. How do I defend myself? I protect myself. I content for the faith by recognizing I need to be tired of prolonged infancy. Are you still a spiritual infant? You know, we got two grandchildren. We're so excited. We're praying for some more. <laughs> My little granddaughter, Olivia, it's exciting to see how she's growing. She went to school. She went to school two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. It's exciting. Isn't it exciting? To see that she's growing up. Are you growing up? Are you growing up? Are you stuck? It's a dangerous considering, considering what I'm talking about, that there is a battle going on and Satan's strategy, it is dangerous, you know, when you are still a baby. Because if you are still a baby, the devil can do, you are, you are in a very, very vulnerable spot. So the apostle challenges you and the Spirit of God would challenge you as he challenges me. Sir, I can do better. Amen. I can do better. Third, third strategy. Satan introduces false doctrine in the church. Satan introduces false doctrine of the church. The parable of the yeast are level 11. In a couple of chapters later in Matthew, Jesus explains, I need to show you that because I don't want you to think I'm just making this up, uh, that this is what it is. By the way, 11 throughout scripture is used as a type uh, for evil. Uh, but Matthew's gospel chapter 16, verse number 5, uh, the uh, uh, verse 5, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Be on your guard against the, the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves. <laughs> he said it because we didn't take any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You have little faith. Why are you talking about your, among yourselves about having no bread? And verse number 12, he says, Then they understood that he was not telling them to God against the yeast used in bread but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What Jesus is speaking about here, as he gives us this parable of the yeast, the kingdom of heaven, verse number 33, is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. I know there are some who would tell us those, this has to do with the spread of the gospel and how the entire world is going to be totally turned uh, to Christ because of the spread of the gospel. I don't see that as what God is saying here because I believe what God is simply saying is that, the, that one of the ways that Satan has opposed God's kingdom is by introducing false teaching into the church. It's no secret that some of the greatest universities in this country that were started to advance the gospel, you know what has become. They have become some of the greatest opponents to the message of the cross. And I tell you, in my little lifetime, I am not that old. Young people. <laughs> but in our lifetime, Richard, we have seen False teaching spread through the church like wildfire. It is hard to believe what we have seen in just our little time. Whether it's about gay ministers and gay bishops, whether it's about abortion, whether it's about divorce or remarriage, whether is there a hell? Oh yes, do you realize now they're challenging is there really a hell? Whether is the Bible reliable? Yes, the church 
It's the, it's the church. It's not the ungodly now who are saying. It's the church who is now challenging that can we depend on the Bible. It's the church who is saying that there is more than one way to heaven. Not the ungodly. It's the church. You can listen to your television and hear preachers tell you that there are more than one way. The leaven has pervaded Christendom. So how do we contend for the faith as I wind this down? How do we contend? Number one, we must recommit to corporate prayer. Germantown Christian Assembly. We are fighting a, 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 a macro war. You understand what I'm saying? It's a, the, the battle is being fought at the macro level. Yes, there's an individual and, and, and sometimes we get a chance to share messages about what he's doing in your life. But he's fighting, we're fighting a, a, a war that is being fought at the, a, a, at the macro level. And we as a church, the Christian church, needs to stand together. It has to be a united stand. It has to be united prayer. And today, we need to recommit, yes. Oh, I know some, uh, I'm not preaching at anybody. Don't think I'm preaching at anybody. But listen, together, we must recommit to corporate prayer. This attack must be dealt with corporately. Thank God there's power in prayer. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. I'm going to just quit. Acts chapter 12. You read it on your own. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 to 18. Uh, you read it. Promise me you'll read it. Promise me you'll read it. Say, yes, I will. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 to 18. It's good to reconnect with some of these scriptures to see how as the church prayed. These guys were in jail. And here the church is praying for them. And who, you remember what happened? While the church is praying, God was doing his thing. Amen. God was doing his thing. And, and, and the very people they were praying at was knocking at the door. They couldn't believe. They had a hard time believing because it was unbelievable how quickly God worked. But my, 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 when we get together in united prayer, it is amazing what God can do. So this morning, this morning, this morning, the Spirit of God comes to GCA and he reminds us, look, we are fighting a war. And he challenges you and he challenges me. All of us who are the good seed, the good seed needs to get together, united, to defend and to Make war against the enemy. But secondly, what is the other thing we're going to do? What is the other thing? We must resolve to be faithful students of the word. We must resolve to be faithful students of the word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I pray, as I prepare this message, I prayed that false doctrine will never seep into this church. That until Jesus comes, we will stand flat-footed on the word of God. Unwavering, regardless of the cost. That we will stand. My friend, if this is going to happen, listen good, if this is going to happen, if this church is going to stand flat-footed as the devil seeks to plant more and more false doctrine in every church, if we are going to stand, then there has got to be a recommitment to the Word of God. There has got to be a recommitment to the Word of God. And I want to talk straight. I want to talk straight to particularly some of the younger generation. This is for every generation, by the way. Every generation must be committed to this word. But listen, I am particularly concerned for the next generation. You young men and young ladies, and particularly the men as the responsibility of leading the church of God is resting on your shoulder. You young men must make a stronger commitment to the word of God. You know, 
Some of you realize my dad had a big impact on us, me and us. Some of you know he was off to a bad start. But when he was an adult, he went back to school. He became an accountant. He studied, studied, studied. He became very successful. The more he studied, the more successful he became. It finally struck him that he had so much time committed to studying and advancing that it was somewhat sidetracking him from God's purpose for his life. You know what my dad did? He decided he was going to take the time that he was studying to study the Bible. Richard will tell you, we were going to my dad's office I mean, we had, he had his office in the, in the house, one of his, you know, so he was doing okay, okay? So, but he had his office, his, all his Bibles, all his Christian books were there. We would go in, Dad was studying. No, don't get me wrong, he played dominoes with us, he played checkers, he took us to the beach. He was a good dad. But he made a commitment. He was going to become a student of the Word of God. I don't know what God is asking you to do. I don't know if he's going to ask, suggest to you that you stop pursuing your academic goal. I don't know what it is. But I'm going to say to you, ask you a question, which may sound like a strange question to ask anyone in this America where education is everything. I need to ask you, if, if, if God were to ask you to put aside pursuing your dream so that you could spend more time in his word, would you? Would you do it? You are not, listen, 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 listen. You are never going to be the student of the Word of God that God expects you to be if you only do it when you have some extra time. And so as I close this message, I remind us again, this is a battleground, not a playground. And God is talking to somebody here today. He's saying to some of you, in light of what you have hear, heard, do you believe you can do better? That's a simple question. Do you believe you can do better? And then, are you willing to do better? I'm going to give you that invitation in a minute. For those of you who said to God, God, I realize this is war. The devil is advancing. God, I can do better. God, I want to do better. God, use me. And if you don't know him as your savior, if you're not sure, if there is even a little doubt in your mind, Say, Jesus, come into my heart.